Happy Tuesday! Okay. Guys, I've got to tell you, went to a fantastic ball on Friday night at Claridge's. Um, and it was just one of those things. The lovely Andrew Eborn, who's a friend of mine, and, and his wife invited me. So I went along dressed in this this very tight ball gown, I have to say. It's so tight that actually I had to get a neighbour to, to zip it up. Anyway, so she had to literally pour me into this dress. So I, I arrived there. The food was amazing. But I've got to tell you, it was with the um, Princess Catherine of Serbia and her husband, who is, Alexandra, who is actually the Duke of Edinburgh's first cousin. And they were such lovely people. And for a very good cause, it was for uh, kids in hospitals in Serbia. But they, but it's a cause I would love to support. It's just amazing. Anyway, had that fabulous evening, got back, had a couple of drinks, got in and couldn't get out of my ball gown. I spent about an hour doing that. And then I thought, I'm going to have to cut myself out of it. And it's gorgeous ball. But anyway, so I got the scissors, went, ah, and had to tip. Anyway, the next oh. day, I phoned my lovely friend, Debbie, and she went, have you seen Jane Fonda's um, photographs? Apparently, she did exactly the same <laughs> and slept in hers. So I should have done that. <laughs> oh, so have you got to have it? I mean, is it? cut so badly you can't fix it or what oh no I can yeah I, I can get it sewn up again but it was just I mean if, if you've ever tried to get out of a ball gown and as Jane Fonda said it's the only time I needed a man well, that, or a woman or a woman exactly. but it, when you're in a shop and you do that and you try on a dress and you think oh that's never going to fit me and of course you're yeah. right it doesn't fit you and then you find yourself in this position don't you go oh my yeah. god Completely and stuck. You can't breathe. And, you know, you it reminds to... me of being a little girl. You remember when your mum was taking your jumpers off and you'd go, yeah. and you get stuck. Oh. Yeah. Anyway, Terrible. our guest, he's yes. coming in, is John yes. Coulson. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hello. Hey. Hi. John, long time, no see. Uh, how lovely to be linking up with you again by the miracle of digital communication or however we're doing this. Lovely oh, yeah. to see you <laughs> Hello, darling. How, how I, I actually saw John in the flesh recently. I mean, he mm -hmm. in the real flesh. I'm very <laughs> jealous. <laughs> exactly. We had one of our lovely dinner bulletins, didn't we? Put in the world to rights. Yes, we do. And when we do that, we just go <laughs> for hours and hours and hours, <laughs> non-stop talking. And it, it was really, really interesting. And of course, we found out certain things about certain. It was well, it was. Always, always fascinating. So, so darling, you are now. He's he's now. Aren't you sort of half and half? Are you half in London and half in, uh, Ormskirk? When I met you, John, a year ago, Debbie said we're giving John a lift back to London. I went, oh, okay, because my my little mini was crammed full of stuff. So Debbie piles in the back with the seat pushed forward with all her designer handbags, okay, and then we <laughs> we get stuck on the M25, and I kept glancing at you, thinking, he's so tall. God, he's tall. Wow, he's a really tall guy. <laughs> Your head was touching the ceiling of my mini. And it wasn't until you actually got out of the car that I realised that it, you were so polite, the seat was pushed forward and um, hadn't gone back. And you were sitting there with your head pinned to the ceiling. <laughs> and I thought you were incredibly oh. tall got out. A very uh, kind person. Well, I'm, 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 what am I? I, I think I'm 5'10 or 11, something like that. So tall enough, adequate. I do remember that journey, and I remember the uh, being sat in the in the car like that, and it felt, uh, you know, I've always drove. I passed my test in a mini, and the driving position is like you're in the, the, the cockpit of an aircraft, uh, except oh, on the road. So yes, it was a lovely trip, a lovely, um, a lovely late winter's trip. Well, I was mortified when you got out that I'd put you in this terrible position with that terrible seat. <laughs> no, it was fantastic. It, it was exhilarating. It was like it was like the Route Fifth route Six. It was like Route Fifth. <laughs> and, 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 and I don't have designer handbags. I have designer copy handbags. Ah, <laughs> well, you're covered in them, darling. Gorgeous. All your Louis Vuitton and everything. I want to know how did how, when was it that you actually found discovered your amazing talent for impersonations and voices? I was quite young. I was about six or seven, I think. 
uh, growing up in Ormskirk in Lancashire. And uh, when we sat around the, the dinner table for our, uh, you know, egg chips and beans and uh, all the family was together. And I just seemed to copy the, the voices of the people that I'd met in the course of a day. And Lancashire's so full of, of rich characters that could have been written by Bennett. So, um, you know, there was Harold from Swarbrix, the delicatessen shop, he's bought like that. There was, uh, there was a painter decorator called uh, Charlie James who uh, <laughs> he spoke somewhere around here. He had that sort of voice, you know. And then I'd, I'd watch the Mike Yarwood show on a Saturday and I just copied what I saw. Never thought it would be a career. But it seemed to make everybody smile and laugh and that egged me on a bit. So, yes, it began when I was about six or seven. Wow. And then, and then John, I mean, how did it become a career? What, what, how did you go? Because me with my funny voices, I always did them as well, never thought anything about them because once you do them, you always do them. But how did that become into a career? What, what happened? Um, I always wondered where to start. And I, I volunteered on hospital radio when I was 17. And throwing in the odd voice, a, a quick Bob Geldof or a Frank Bruno, <laughs> was a great little party trick on the show. Yeah. Uh, started making lots of demo cassettes and sending them to other stations, Radio City, Red Rose Radio. Eventually, I got a job on the overnight show at Red Rose Radio in Preston, doing two till six in the morning. And I started working around various regional stations. And when I was 21, I was working at uh, Viking Radio in Hull. Um, and I think I'd, uh, I'd interviewed Lenny Henry who was doing a show at the Whole New Theatre. And so I chatted to him on my afternoon show. And we just ended up having a real good laugh with, with voices and mucking about and things like that. And he said, oh, you should, you should send a tape to Spitting Image. They're always looking for people. And he advised me. And so I did. I edited a few voices together onto a cassette um, and sent it into uh, Spitting Image. And eventually I got a job on, on, on there. And I've also got to, the receptionist at Viking Radio uh, to thank uh, Anne-Marie. There was one day when I'd finished um, a show and I'd been really mucking about with voices and, and copying the newsreader and uh, whoever else, a, a, a range of characters, probably Chris Eubank, John Major, all the characters of the time. And uh, Anne-Marie in her beautiful Hull accent said, you know, never mind, <laughs> so in between Madonna records. Don't waste the fact you can do all these characters. Make that your job. Uh, make that, never mind talking in between status quo chones. <laughs> Uh, she had this beautiful. She's got this beautiful whole accent, so distinctive. And the, a little light bulb appeared above my head, and I thought, right, well, let me take aim in that direction. And that was really the start. I had a friend wow. of mine from Hull who used to say he gave up drinking. I said, what do you want to drink? And he said, grapefruit Joe's. <laughs> 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 in in Hull, you have a pint of mild at five to five, or maybe a white wine. <laughs> and <soda. laughs> <laughs> I'd love to hear your Bob Geldof. Right. Okay. Well, I I, I believe you know. I, I think this might be the moment. I, I I think it was great the way that you just teed that up there. So now I can say it, and that is that is fantastic. It's not a disgrace. Oh well, that was refreshing. <laughs> love it. That's brilliant. So there's lots of nice, exciting things, aren't there, happening in your world? Well, I, I do enjoy um, doing a lot of the big finish Doctor Who recordings. Yeah. Uh, this is a show I've been fascinated by all my life. So I, I, I do a lot of characters with the, the big finish team. Uh, sometimes the fourth Doctor. Oh. You know, yes, that wonderful velvety boom of Tom Baker. That's a, you, you can't help but you have to open your eyes wide. <laughs> or perhaps <laughs> John Pertwee. With the Pertwee voice, you become a much more elegant and one's posture increases uh, uh, greatly, and the roll of the eyes and the reversing of the polarity. Or perhaps uh, the wonderful Nicholas Courtney, uh, who played the dear Brigadier. That's right, Doctor, I do hope you pay just a little attention. So uh, that's that's always terrific fun to, to join the Who was your, who's your favourite Doctor? Uh, John Pertwee was my first. He introduced it to me, and through him I discovered all the others. Um, I, it took me a little while to get used to when Tom Baker came in because he was so comedic and so utterly different, which you have to be when you take over the Doctor Who role. That there's a responsibility to be wildly contrasting to your 
predecessor. But by the time of a story called The Pyramids of Mars, I thought it was absolutely terrific. And I discovered all the others then, Patrick Troughton, William Hartnell, uh, and then Peter Davison came in when I was about 16, and he was fantastic. He was sort of like a pop star Doctor Who. Um, so he always been fascinated with the various chapters across the decade. God, it tells your age, doesn't it? If you if you kind of think, who was your Doctor Who? Yeah. Mine was Patrick was... Trout. Oh, yeah, dear Pat Trout. He's the Doctor's Doctor. Most of the Doctors uh, always look at Patrick Trout as a marker uh, of how it should be done, because he was so quirky, so scientific, beautiful timing, great character. Um, and there he was, this hobo just drifting through space. It shows how old I am. <laughs> Because I remember watching the first episode of Doctor Who and before it was the news and I was on my own. I was about six or seven. I was by myself and I went to my grandpa and I said, it's, it's just said that President Kennedy has been assassinated. What does that mean, assassinated? Does that mean he's been killed? And Doctor Who was on exactly straight after that so i've always remembered that and of course it's in all the books now if you look that's when it that's when it happened the reason the news only came over to england at that time because even though it happened was because of the lack of communication between america and the uk and i remember being wow. terrified <laughs> terrified of Doctor Who. Um, I used to literally hide behind the sofa and there was one, and Leslie Nichols, the same as me, there was one monster, which was a cotton wool monster. And if you touch this monster, you would turn into cotton wool. And for years I couldn't touch cotton wool. And Leslie Nichols the same. Oh, <laughs> that really is scary, isn't it? Yeah. Mine was oh, the Cybermen. Do you remember the Cybermen? Yeah. Oh, that was scary. Yes, they were rather yeah. like industrial suits of armour with just yes. these black holes for eyes. Ooh. Um, rather moving. Yeah, really. There's a very small, almost like a teardrop beneath each eye, which sort of symbolised the people who had been taken over and turned into Cybermen, <laughs> which was a very unnerving um, uh, feature of the Cybermen. And yes, I, it's my ambition to uh, live in a house where there's a suit of armour on one side and a Cyberman opposite. <laughs> oh, I'm sure you can work that one out, darling. But oh, isn't it weird, those on... memories, like Debbie's memory of being six and all those things coming together, it's yeah. just incredible, the memories that we have when we were children. And when yes, you and said it... about when you said about um, when President Kennedy was assassinated, I remember that too, and I was a very, very young kid. And I remember my mother sobbing. And so I started sobbing. I didn't know why. And, and then I realised it was very serious and because she adored the Kennedys. And But those are sort of milestones in our lives, aren't they? But yeah, you're they, too young, uh, John. You're, you're only a baby, aren't you? <laughs> well, you know, 55. <laughs> it's, wonder baby. <laughs> it's baby. very reassuring to be, uh, to be referred to in that way when one is 55. So uh, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> But you are a Gemini, you are forever young. Yes, I suppose, I suppose so. That is said. That yes. is said. A bit sort of, you know, the, 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 the air, the, the, the mercurial quicksilver, that kind of thing. Yes, that's been said. I'm just very unfocused. Are you? <laughs> I don't know. Yes, I, I always, at school, I, I would tend to not concentrate on what I was supposed to be doing. But my mind was elsewhere. I was inventing and thinking of what I wanted to do. I was interested in uh, in a, a, astronomy and um, UFOs and ah. uh, ghosts and how they could possibly work. What physical force is operating there? Was it a sort of a Bluetooth signal that we haven't figured out yet? Um, you know, all of the I was thinking in this sort of area rather than on quadratic equations. Yes, exactly, wow. which I think are completely pointless. But it, it's very interesting because your career as an impressionist comedian has actually given you the chance to actually fulfil that need, hasn't it? Because you've done so much in that area. Yes, I think it's true. It, it's true because I've impersonated uh, the experts and the scientists, <laughs> such as Patrick Moore or Professor Brian Cox or Carl Sagan, um, I've subsequently been invited to their programmes and to work with them. Oh, um, do some scientists for us. Well, indeed, indeed. This is a very, very good point, indeed. Sir Patrick <laughs> Barr spoke very, very quickly in this way. And there he was. 
And in his later years, he'd get very philosophical. And he would say, yes, I, uh, I'm, I'm 89 now. I don't think I'll make 90. And I'm, I'm perfectly relaxed about that. Um, I realise I'm on the last lap. And so I intend to spend this time as drunk as possible. <laughs> Did he make 90? Uh, no, he he didn't. He, he he almost did, but no, he, it was December 2013 when he went. So yeah, he was still in the 89 zone. But um, yes, he I think he I think he went to inspect uh, Neptune and um, and Pluto and the Kuiper Belt very quickly. You can imagine that cosmic journey. Yeah, yeah, I can. Yeah. Can I just ask you, John, when you mm -hmm. said UFOs and yes. ghosts, have you ever seen a ghost or and or a UFO? I've never seen a UFO. I would dearly love to. You hear some very strange tales about how they work, how they fly, how they, they don't operate by the laws of physics as we know them on planet Earth. Uh, they could be from interdimensional. Who, who knows? We probably don't have the vocabulary for it, but it's a yeah. fast thing to contemplate. I've never seen a... Well, have I seen a ghost? Maybe I... Going back to Patrick Moore... Uh, there was one time when we were having dinner in his uh, in his dining room, and at the side of the room was um, a very, very, very old carved wooden drinks cabinet, um, which I now own, as a matter of fact. Oh. Um, one day when uh, an astronomer was in there, and he was talking about, he was telling a bit of a saucy tale, and then oh yeah, and then all, and then just as the language got especially fruity um a shot glass that was resting on top of this old 17th century cabinet shot off and flew across the room as if to sort of chastise this fellow and his fruity mm. language which is not suitable for such a respectable dining room and uh, patrick moore said oh yes don't worry, that'll be claude yes he's haunted here for a long time or it might be mother i don't know but yes he, he just put it in his <laughs> fly <laughs> flying shot oh glass. i love that <laughs> I love that because, you know, um, talking about UFOs, when my parents went to, when they were doing studying uh, yeah. the whole UFO thing for that programme they did called UFO, incidentally, yeah. Yeah, so they, came, they came back from NASA and they did the Skywalk um, and they had to sign the Secrecy Act and everything because they did all the research and they kept both came back saying that there were definitely UFOs because they, but they couldn't talk about it, but, but there were stuff, yes. stuff going on, yeah. It, it, it is amazing, and astronauts have said the same. Um, yeah. Test pilots have said the same. It puzzles me as to why it seems to be covered up so much. Yeah. I, I think we could confirm that alien life does exist somewhere in the galaxy or in the wider universe. Uh, intelligent civilizations of alien life. If we could confirm that, it would be the greatest discovery of humankind from every mm -hmm. point of view. And it, it would. It, it, it's do, you, do you think that I think the reason that it isn't is because I think a lot of aliens are here anyway? I'm sure. Yes, I wouldn't be surprised. Mm -hmm. Because you know about the uh, uh, rhesus, negative, rhesus blood groups, don't you? Oh, right. OK. Right. So, so there's rhesus positive. I don't know what blood group you are. And then there's rhesus negative. And rhesus negative is relatively new blood group i'm rhesus negative o and of course i am called the um the universal donor because i can give my blood to anybody but nobody can give their blood to me i have to have rhesus negative o but i can give my blood to anyone at all and there's a lot of if you if you read up about it a lot of people say that it's, it came from northern europe mm -hmm. so where i mean and why did it suddenly arrive this blood group it's very interesting to uh, actually read up about it and of course i think that everything's to do with aliens i think that um you know i, I have a conspiracy mind about everything anyway um because it's a much nicer way to live isn't it I, th I think to leave room for fascination to leave yes. room for a great sense of possibility um i heard an analogy that the amount of the universe that we have observed uh to see if um there could be any intelligent life out there. If we were to scale that down, I think it's something like um, taking a shot glass of water out of every Olympic-sized swimming pool and just looking into that single shot glass and saying, oh, well, there's nothing there. We've hardly looked into the vastness. Um, yeah. But it's, it's a fasc I, I love the sense of fascination. I love the sense of possibility. I love mm. the sense of what we don't know yet. 
As, as uh, Arthur C. Clarke always said, the universe is not only stranger than we do imagine, it's stranger than we can imagine. Um, and that's that's very uh, fascinating to me. Well, yes. it's also like how, how the internet suddenly arrived. Yes, exactly. Try explaining the internet or even a fax machine to Henry VIII. That would be really <laughs> paranormal and you'd probably mm -hmm. be executed. Um, <laughs> Solar eclipses uh, used to be paranormal to uh, early people who witnessed them. They thought that the sun was being eaten by a dragon. And so they'd go out there with their drums and bang the drums. And then when the uh, when the diamond ring effect of the sun returning, the sunlight coming through uh, at the side of the moon, when the sunlight came back, they thought they'd frightened off the dragon. So oh. that was paranormal to them, but of course not to us. Oh, yeah. Wow. We're spending so much time destroying everything, aren't we, on this planet? What a shame. There's so much to to well, learn. Well, exactly. The Earth the Earth will be around for another four billion years yet. So the only thing that uh, the human race may destroy is itself. The planet will mm -hmm. go on. and mm -hmm. um, But hopefully we'll learn. Hopefully there's um, periods that we live through now are there to, to teach and show us what's at stake. And hopefully the tides can be done in sufficient time. Are you at present working up to your Bidens and your Trumps for what's <laughs> going to come up soon? Yes, exactly, speaking of the uh, the immediate future. Mm -hmm. Yes, they're very interesting. Joe Biden is very, he's very relaxed and um, and there's there's a great sense of, uh, of steadiness and surety about him. You know, talking about the James Webb Space Telescope, we can see the birth of the universe 13 billion years ago. Man, I was just a kid back then. <laughs> as, opposed to, <laughs> as opposed to the Donald, who is very, very full of bluster, full of bluster, <laughs> and the way his lips go when he talks. You know, I remember the fastener on my Auntie Hilda's handbag. It looked like that. Don <laughs> <laughs> is, is horrible. He, he really is horrible. And more importantly, are you going to have another birthday party this year? You always used to have fabulous birthday parties, and now they've stopped. Yes, I've not done one for about five years. Maybe this is the year, eh? Maybe this yeah. is the year. Yes. Maybe, I'll, maybe I'll throw one I'll, as long as all of you lot come along and let's have a we job. We will. <gasps> we'll be your birds. We'll be your birds. Lovely. We'll Lovely. be John's. John's. Right, We've run right. out of time, darling. It's been a really oh. interesting show. Is there anything you would like to, to say to us before you go? Is there anything exciting in the near future we should watch out for? Mm -hmm. Well, all I'd like to say really is thank you and lots of love to you all. It's been very, very super to um, to uh, speak to you. And uh, yes, I've just been um, wondering about when uh, I'm going to give the uh, the one-man show all about Les Dawson another run. Um, wow. I think within, within the next couple of years or so, I'll give that another run because I, I, I thoroughly loved playing playing Les. Um, so yeah, I'll be I'll be getting around to that in due course. And when you Brilliant. do, please come on and talk to us again. Promise? Why? Well, yeah. before that. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, and I, I, I certainly will about the Les show and especially before, yes, definitely. All right. We love Thank you very you, much, John. Thanks, love darling. Love you. Love you, darling. Bye. 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 Yeah, I love him. That was a very interesting conversation. Well, honestly, I, I didn't know that about him, about the UFO and the ghost thing. And, and I think anyone who investigates that's those different dimensions has got a very sort of an interesting brain, haven't they? Yeah, it's yeah. true. But you know, what he said about, you know, the, everything being in a different dimension. Yeah. It, that's probably where they are. They're probably right here, but in yeah. a different dimension, so we can't With feel that. them. But they, they can probably see us. It's been a, a really, really spooky, interesting show. It has, hasn't it? <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> wonderful show. Loved, Loved it. Fun. Yeah. Thank you. Thank All you, right. guys. I know. Nice you. Thank you so much. Friday. Friday. Yes. Bye.